Welcome to a very unique episode of Meet the Ocean. If you don't already know, we are an educational nonprofit that produces conservation themed media for kids, adults, and adult kids. I'm your host, Paul North, but not for very long, at least not today. Because for today's episode, the tables have turned. Normally, this is where I would start telling you about our special guests, the amazing work they do in some far off location, etc. Except today, our guest will be interviewing me. What? Now, why would we go and do a thing like that? Well, we just so happen to be celebrating. Recently, we released our 20th podcast episode with plenty of other fun educational material available online for public digestion. We have two brand new short podcast series, Kids Talk and Encounters, both of which include audience participation, collecting the opinions and stories of people around the world. Make sure to check them out because they are a lot of fun. And as a nonprofit, Meet the Ocean has been touring schools and children's hospitals, delivering interactive educational experiences, temporary plankton tattoos, and much, much more. Today, we are announcing the launch of our Patreon page. Patreon is a platform used to fund creative and meaningful projects via public participation. That means you. The effort and talent of Meet the Ocean's first 20 podcasts were funded by willpower, credit cards, and a handful of generous private donors that helped us keep the project moving forward, or as we like to say, help keep the lights on. Today, we are asking our listeners to become Ocean Defenders. By contributing as little as $1 a month, you will directly contribute to the production and educational outreach of Meet the Ocean's program. There are different tiers with rewards and such for different contributions, but the coolest part is that you get to be part of a community that supports our ocean outreach. And being a part of that community gets you access to exclusive Meet the Ocean content. The people who make Meet the Ocean what it is are a small team of passionate people who work hard to bring these necessary stories forward so that the public may hear them. Our Patreon community is set up to help achieve sustainable funding so that we can focus on what Meet the Ocean does best. In this episode, you will get to meet the team as they introduce themselves and tell you what they do and why they do it. Thank you for listening, and now, on to the show. Dr. Jimmy White is an Australian marine biologist, expert herpetologist, that's snake scientist, and expedition leader with National Geographic Expeditions. He speaks publicly on the effects of climate change and incorporates optimism and strategy for how humanity should aim for a better future. Today, he interviews Paul North, the founder of Meet the Ocean. This interview took place aboard the National Geographic Orion on an expedition to witness the white bears of Svalbard. You know you're gonna you're gonna have to sit up if you if you really want to interview me, Jimmy. Sorry, sorry, I'll stop searching. <laughs> so we're gonna turn the tables. We've just listened to how many podcasts now? Uh, at this point, we have six online, seven is in development. All right, technically, this is episode 22. I was thinking after a month of listening to Paul and talk about Meet the Ocean in his sleep and in the shower and brushing his teeth and during meal times that we should get out some of the information to everybody else and find out what makes the founder of Meet the Ocean tick. The first thing I want to know is, how did you meet the ocean, Paul North? Like any good New Yorker, it was the Jersey Shore. You know, it's it's a cool little beach down in the Wildwood area. We'd kind of go there, Sandy Hook. You're talking flat, long landscape. You can walk out in the water really far. But I think the first time my mom brought me there, I was about three. Uh, had Had a boogie board, you know, that my brothers 
pad and they tried to put me on it and I just got tossed by the waves. But I, I remember playing with horseshoe crabs, just sort of sitting and watching them because they're still so strange to behold even now. But I, I think I watched one for like an hour and a half. And it's one of those where I don't think your first interaction with the ocean, you're even able to make sense of it at first. You, you need to, you need time to process that experience. But yep, Jersey Shore, East Coast, baby, baby. Wow, you just talked about Mama North, and Mama North was with me when I saw my very first polar bear with you two weeks ago in the Arctic. And she was telling me over dinner that she always wanted you to be a preacher. Yeah. And now you're sitting here spreading the good word about the ocean. How did you make that transition? Oh, Mama North. Well, uh, my my mother raised me. She raised me well at least as if I'm allowed to say that a lot of it was Sundays in church so I I got the rhythm you know watching these men speak to an audience week after week changing the type the topic ever so slightly but you know you you learn how they do it why they do it and certainly uh, their passion and Man, I, uh, I've, I've interacted with the ocean in so many ways, and I see how it's viewed, sort of day to day in our culture. And I, and when I say culture, that's that's a world culture. It's not just Western. It's, it's everyone. And I think the two major ways that we look at the ocean is either for vacation or as a resource for our food. And there's something about that that. Um, feels lacking to me because there's so much more Uh, there's so much more complexity and other creatures that I had to create a platform that incorporated a little bit of preacher a little bit of creative writing and a lot of sass I suppose so you're a masters in playwriting who's also a commercial fisherman who's now preaching the good word about ocean conservation and resource management. Life is full of transitions. That is quite the transition. (laughs) Hi, this is Andy Gettings, editor and mixer for Meet the Ocean. I have the exhilarating task of organizing all the bits and pieces of Meet the Ocean content and turning it into an episode. I make sure it flows right, sounds right, and add in some creative transitions of my own. I first met the ocean when I was 12 years old while vacationing at Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Although brief, the 15 minutes I spent in the 58 degree water left a lasting reverence for the ocean that has stuck with me ever since. So, when did you first meet the ocean? I got my master's degree in creative writing, focus in playwriting, so a lot of work in the theater. That was in Arizona, the desert. Uh, You're talking 100 degrees Fahrenheit at night very often. And after four years there, I, I had a job. It was teaching speed reading to adults, and I had to wear a tie. I had to drive a car where the air conditioning didn't work and I wasn't getting paid nearly enough to justify any of those things. So upon getting my degree, I, uh, man, what was the website? Uh, it was something like workinginalaska.com. It, 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 it totally looked like a sham. It was one of those that's like, pay us $10 a month and we'll give you access to all these captain names. So I, I paid the $10 and I wrote five emails, and two days later, I had three responses. You got mail. One guy said, and he was so excited, it was scary. He's like, oh, yeah, I, I want you to come up, and you're going to help me build the boat, and then you're going to help me run the boat, and maybe one day you're going to own the boat. And I hadn't even seen Alaska yet, so that wow. totally freaked me out. Uh, the other guy was a total nut job, which is status quo uh, for Alaska, and that's both an insult and a compliment. But then 
I talked to Butch Schollenberg, Richard Schollenberg, but everyone knows him as Butch or, or Butchie. And he kind of felt me out. I definitely didn't tell him that I was from New York. And I definitely told him I could cook, which wasn't true in the slightest. <laughs> Lying on a resume that's never been done before, ever. Ever, ever. No, I mean, doesn't putting waffles in a toaster count? Totally. On a fishing boat? Absolutely. If you can break bread and make bacon, you're done. Exactly. All, all they want is bread and fat. Yeah. You know, for sustenance. Uh, but, you know, he he was no fool. He was testing me out, and he said, well, do you know how to tie any knots? And barely being able to tie my shoes, I went online, and I said, dear Google... What is the most pop? I think I put what is the most popular commercial fishing knot? <laughs> and I said, of course I know how to tie a bow line, which anyone who works on the water knows that's how bow it's line. spelled, but it's pronounced bowling because in, in sailing culture they always shorten things. It's not a main sail, it's a mainsail, and it's a bowling. So he already knew right then that I was full of it, uh, but he hired me anyways. Nice. I like it. And so, and New York, mum wants you to be a preacher. You arrive in Alaska, from fresh from four years in the desert writing plays. What's the first thing that you feel when you see the boat? Oh. Because you didn't tell yourself anything up until that point. But the first time you have the duffel bag in your hand and you're looking at the boat and you have to step onto the boat, that's it. I can remember that feeling of stepping on for the first time. Uh, you know, it slightly lists, given your weight, and you just, you understand instantly that you're on the water and your life's about to change. <laughs> you start looking at the things that can kill you. Just everything. Yeah. Literally everything. And I think within the first three sentences, he's like, that is the deck wench. That's going to try and kill you a lot. I'm like, good to know. Um, the boat was the Sea Mist. It was a 50-foot commercial saner. What that means is it has a net that's about a quarter of a mile long, a cork line on top that keeps it buoyant, and a lead line on the bottom which keeps it down in the strong elastic currents. My job was to stack the leads. But that's also the side that the net is coming up on, so you're never dry and you're always getting hit with things falling be it a sea star, uh, a, a jellyfish, a halibut, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, I had more jellyfish on my face in that job than ever before, but I, I still don't think I answered your question about how did I feel. There was, a, there was a sense of adventure, obviously. Homer, Alaska is where I was, and I still think that's one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Ketchumac Bay just stretches. There's, there's glaciers across you. You're right there at the Pacific Rim. There's volcanoes on the horizon, and when the sun drops low, you see their silhouettes. It's it's gorgeous. So I was definitely having just finished one chapter of getting a master's and throwing yourself completely into a situation that you knew nothing in was, was humbling. You can't come into those situations with any ego. If you bring ego to Alaska, you get flattened pretty quickly. Well, that, if you take ego to the ocean, the ocean just smiles at you and goes, oh, really? The ocean and the fishing boat doesn't care at all. It doesn't care what you have in money. It doesn't care why you're there. It doesn't care who you were before. It doesn't care if you're a good person or a bad person. If you aren't paying attention, it'll snatch you. Easily. And it, it, it's just that it happen every day, and I love the equality of that. And so it's you versus it all the time man Alaska taught me so much and my father died early so I didn't have that male figure in my life being like this is a wrench this is how you use a wrench this is an allen key this is how you use an allen key so the captain he would ask me for a tool and I had some grasp about what was what but very often I was completely in the dark and he did some things to teach me but really, his answer to the majority of my questions was, figure it out. <laughs> and I, I hated him for it at first. I was like, why can't you just tell me? But, and this is a lesson for everyone, that's all you have in life is yourself. If you rely on others to 
teach you lessons that you should be learning on your own, then you're going to be way behind the mark. Well, you have a life by Google. You have life by Google. You know, every, like, what's a wrench look like? Type in wrench, Google images. You know, what's an impact drive look like? How do I use an impact driver? How do I charge an impact driver? Google, Google, Google. It's great. It's amazing. We've never had more access to information. But what you did there was even bigger than that. I feel like, and I, many people might not know what they want to do, but they get onto a pathway or they do know what they want and they get so fixated on that path, they're going down this career progression of you know, tertiary education or apprenticeships, whatever it is. And they miss opportunities like you had when you went to Alaska, where you just immerse yourself in something that's so foreign. The commer- learning how to commercial fish is just a small part of what you take away with it. Like you now know that no matter what happens, you can go and earn income doing anything. You can work with anyone and you're going to figure out a way to make five grand and survive and put you in an environment that's potentially one of the most hazardous on the planet and you're going to learn it, survive it, and profit from it. It's incredibly, f- not fortunate, it's the wrong word. An insightful can only be used if you did it at the start knowing all those things was going to happen and I don't think you did because I definitely didn't do the same thing. But Steve Jobs gives this amazing speech to a, the end of a university year and he's talking about, you know, you can only join the dots looking backwards. Looking forwards, you have no idea what they are but looking backwards, you can see that all your experience with a commercial fisherman is now starting to inform when you're having these discussions on Meet the Ocean because you aren't talking about it as an abstract term you learnt in a textbook in a fisheries management subject. You were a commercial fisherman. You had a commercial fishing licence, yes? Oh, I still do. Still do? Yeah. So that's that's the next chapter. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Hello, world. My name is Kelsey Anderson, and I am responsible for the soundscapes you hear during every episode. I am the sanguine, soporific, and spiffy sound lady. My colleagues might describe my design as deft, dexterous, or dinkum, but I prefer effervescent, like your favorite soft drink. Similar to Paul, I've taken the roundabout way of getting here, a filmmaker turned scientist, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Together, let's board the auricular airplane and travel the world with Meet the Ocean. But I definitely want to address something because where I am now as a as an educator and a promoter of ocean conservation, uh, there are those who have said, you know, they, they step on board with us who are here. And basically, the ships we work on were a seagoing seminar. You know, we are here to accent their experience. And someone asked, why is a fisherman on board here? And, and this was in Alaska. And I wasn't there in the capacity of a fisherman. I was there as a diver, an undersea specialist. But in their brain, something was a foul saying, I, I can't listen to a fisherman talk about salmon farming versus wild and all this. But the thing is, I learned more about the ocean as a fisherman than I think I could have in a marine biology class, at least to a degree. You know, I wasn't getting the scientific names, but I was getting interaction on a first-hand basis and I can when I when I walk amongst others who are in this field who have sort of gone from the classroom straight into the field and they sort of have that I don't know what's going on here moment I I felt like I I got to fast forward through some of that just because of that experience yeah definitely (laughs) salmon You have a really good season. Some guys go out and they blow that money very quickly on travel to XYZ Island and XYZ chemical substances. But, um, and I did travel a lot, but I also, I ended up buying a sea cucumber permit. Uh, A sea cucumber is a relative of the sea stars and the sea urchins. They're all 
echinoderms. Echinoderm comes from the Greek. It means hedgehog skin or spiny skin. And they're very valued in Asia. So this fishery is probably the most cavalier thing I've ever taken part in. You're clipping a bag to your chest and swimming as hard and fast as you can, grabbing these guys by hand and swimming with, if you can just imagine swimming with a bag of 300 pounds of sea cucumbers, (laughs) I can't even say it. (laughs) My name is Vin Gast. I compose music for the Meet the Ocean podcast. I work alongside Andrew Gettings and the rest of the Meet the Ocean crew to create these soundscapes and songs you're listening to. Beats. I make beats. I like chocolate and ice cream and shrimp. Achoo. Poo poo. Whoop dee doo. So your mum and Norse's uh, business plan for her son has bounced from preacher to playwright with a master's to salmon fisherman in Alaska to slug fisherman and now founder for non-for-profit Meet the Ocean. Yeah, there's only that one last step in there and, you know, you and I both uh, currently work for Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic I don't think I would have gotten in the door here if I didn't have the Alaska dive experience that sea cucumbers gave me. And I would come up from a dive and while other people would be smoking cigarettes and drinking their Diet Cokes, I'd be looking up what I saw that day. And I knew I was going to be crap at the job because if you're looking at a nudibrink instead of scouring for more sea cucumbers, then you're not going to catch as much. But I was just fascinated by what I saw. And when I interviewed to be an undersea specialist with this company, I could hear the confusion in the person who was interviewing me. They're like, what? Yeah. (laughs) And I said, if I run into something, I want to know what it is. I want to know how long does it live? How does it breed? And I've developed that sort of template as every day passes and I, and I dive more and more and run into more and more in different locations in the world. But at that moment, it was simply driven by curiosity. So the podcast really got going. You had access to these incredible people that we work with every single day. I mean, working for this company, more above the travel and the wildlife is literally the ability to spend time with some of our you know, heroes and, and pines of the field. So I think I was looking through the podcast, you've interviewed a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, you've interviewed the godfather of um, dive medicine, yeah, and who else? Oh, well, the episodes that are on air right now, uh, we have Noah killer whale researchers, uh, Dr. John Durbin and Holly Fernbach. First episode was this English naturalist Ian Bullock who just speaks poetry as he's talking about Arctic terns. Don Walsh is someone I've interviewed. He's literally an ocean elder and that is small company. You know, Sylvie Earle's there and and the people who have spent their lives doing ocean conservation work. Ice core scientists down collecting samples in Antarctica and They tell me stories of ice libraries where they go in and say, hey, I'll take XL5-7 and they come out with this, you know, four foot long cylindrical piece of ice that they then get to slice and collect atmospheric samples from. I, I have learned more sitting behind these microphones than I think any other educational component in my life, just listening to these people's stories. 
Well, the best thing is we're learning because you're bringing the stories to us. I mean, you and I are on this ship all the time. We see these people and meet them. But now through this, everyone can hear their stories, which I think is is critical. And I remember, I have to tell you, we actually had a, a email conversation six months ago. And then you were going to go and interview, I want to say a National Geographic photographer, Susan Soybert, and you were having some imposter syndrome. Yeah. Talk to us about how, I mean, you've got lots of kids listening to this. How did you deal with talking to some of your idols? How did you deal about preparing for interviews and being able to walk up to them and saying, can I have an hour and a half of your time to talk about something you love? Yeah, certainly. Imposter syndrome, uh, a, a phrase that you introduced me to, but I had been feeling, and it's that, how did I get here? How, how did how did this path lead me to this place and am I even worthy of, of doing all these things and I think these are things that the human mind does to itself but part of that's healthy I think because in a way questioning yourself allows you to make the sort of decisions that will sharpen your game let us say you know like the questions you ask, how you approach these things, the energy you bring to it. But when you prepare to interview someone who you know has been and done and seen, and you don't say, oh, you're, you're my hero, you're, you're this, you're, you have to talk to them like the human that they are, but really get the experience. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do with Meet the Ocean is have a platform that people can share their stories because if we get the scientists and the surfers and you know those who make salt for the table out of the ocean if we get as many of these perspectives together including the fishermen including the herpetologists like yourself I mean there are sea snakes after all if we collect these stories and we get them out to the public then I think we'll better understand uh, what this is and you know how how do how do you grow your confidence well it begins by putting in a lot of work but also paying attention to the response that you're getting you know when i when i see someone like david dubelay and his wife jennifer hayes uh having a laugh with me in a closed room with microphones i say all right this is this is special And what they just said was amazing. And I'm going to bring that into the editing studio and slap a little music on it and give it to an audience. They're going to think it's amazing. And thus learning happens. There's no set way that each episode goes. We kind of play it to, we structure it around the interview itself, but they all have the power of storytelling. by writing and recording creature features to example the character, oddities, and perils of all ocean creatures. I first met Paul North on the high seas of the South Pacific and was invited to join the podcast team as a regular contributor at the age of 11. But now I'm in high school, so expect more short segments, ocean facts, overfishing-related anxiety, and shark puns. Too many for my own good, really. Sorry, that was just terrible. Yeah, I've really jumped the great white on that one. Anyway, sharing the story of the ocean is something we're really good at, but we need your help to keep it going. Become an Ocean Defender by donating to our Patreon page. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to never miss a creature feature. Uh, I mean, to never miss an episode. I don't think anyone could have said that better. My the follow up to that is, you're speaking to these people, and you know you've literally just used the title, "Elder of the Ocean," you know, and throwing out people like Sylvia and David Dublay, and but the focus of Meet the Ocean is really about empowering and giving knowledge to the the coming generation. Absolutely. So why did you choose the younger generation? Uh. 
obvious reasons, they're the ones who have to face what previous generations have had to do and they need to make the decisions that are going to help themselves and the people on our planet and the creatures on the planet. You know, it, it, it's not enough to just save ourselves. We, we have to make sure that we're not taking down all these species with us. So beginning with the youth, and as you know, you have two amazing daughters, you know, there's children have open minds. It, it's only through repetition that they become closed off or prejudice uh, or whatever sort of negative you might apply to that. But if you keep curiosity alive, you know, like you've described to me with octopus in the past, you can have a perfect environment, but if the octopus isn't curious, then it dies. And that's not going to happen to a kid. There's video games out there. There's there's always going to be some sort of stimulus, but... I, oh, I was going to say, I, dis, I totally I disagree. I think it absolutely does happen with a kid. I think that we... You're more and more insulated away from feeling good or bad to comfortably numb in the middle and we do we have a nerf culture where we're going to wrap you up in a nerf ball we're going to wrap you up in glad wrap and you're not allowed to get cut you're not allowed to fall off this we're going to regulate the height of the playground to be this high so you can't sue us and we're going to have a padded surface for you to fall on and we'll make sure that you can only fall this far and you're removing all the physical and mental resistance that shapes you Right, shapes you. I think you see it. We've just been to some of the oldest mountains on the planet that have been shaped from millions of years of water as ice and flowing streams. Right, that's only possible through exerting pressure and resistance. And I feel like people are the same. I feel like if you don't, from when you're one and two, have the commercial fishermen, you have the parental figure the uncle the the scout the teacher whatever saying figure it out here's the piece of rope find the knot learn how to do it google it and then try it put yourself in a position of being completely uncomfortable going from a new yorker and a playwright to alaskan commercial fisherman i think that's really important i think it's missing and i think that this podcast is becoming an amazing conduit to having those statesmen, those elders of the ocean and of our civilization who have made good decisions and bad ones, and you're giving the young generation a context to make better decisions. So the, that's where I think Meet the Ocean is strong. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm Bryson, and we're Brushtone. We defend the ocean by providing digital media services for Meet the Ocean helping to spread its important mission across the globe. We've been with Meet the Ocean since the beginning, developing its branding and online presence. We're proud to be part of a team that's working hard to protect what is truly one of the dopest parts of our natural world. Check us out at brushtone.com. course when I uh, even began to have the idea to form Meet the Ocean I said to myself I can't just be another ocean conservation nonprofit that sort of walks a line that doesn't really want to offend people uh, but really wants to make you feel good about sea turtles or whatever your target species is but rather to use the power of storytelling to kind of get into the nitty gritty, to hear what the fishermen are talking about. Uh, there's ritual and there's financial gain and there's blood in the water and, and these things are not always gonna be as, as padded as they are, but hearing the personal nature of these stories from the Nat Geo photographers who have been photographing underwater for 60 years to the continuum of a scientist who is floating around in Antarctica with a microphone in the water to hear what a Waddell seal sounds like. That's, that's the kind of resources 
where real education can happen. I even wrote to my the head of my playwriting program a few days ago. I said, just to help you sleep at night, I haven't abandoned playwriting. I've just altered its form into this ocean knowledge conservation podcast. So, well, you're stage managing us now. Yeah, yeah, and my and myself. I mean, it it's all production uh, in a way, but it also entertainment is a way to access your audience. You nailed something before. If you you have very very strong conservation organizations that have a ethos and a political bent that precludes them from ever having a discussion with a particular party like a commercial fisherman WWF is nep you know it's Greenpeace Sea Shepherd when you, you say these names you're talking about there's a certain context that comes to them and if you're coming from the other side of the conversation if you're a commercial fisherman or you're you know collecting for marine uh, marine fish tanks or you have any form of extractive resource or you want to do an urban development you come to the table it's like pistols at dawn you're not coming for the conversation you're coming armed with your ideas and your knowledge and you guys are going to rebut everything they say and you're putting yourself in a state for conflict before you have the conversation there's only going to be one outcome if you come prepared to the room for conflict and be conflict and once you're at, there's nowhere else to go and so platforms like this that don't really have a feel and like the name escapes me but you're like the weird hotel where there's the rules are that there's no conflict in the hotel like outside is war but inside you know like heaven and hell whatever it is everyone's on this plane has to behave themselves then once they go back out to their planes they can do whatever they want but in this realm in this conversation you have David Dublay Silver Earl has the same voice as the slug commercial fisherman from Alaska who still holds the license and I think that kind of equality in, in messaging and in time and giving people both sides a legitimate both sides not a fabricated both sides but legitimate both sides is essential because while we have the Google culture of having instantly accessible information we are lacking the ability to critically disseminate it and critically think about it that's what we're lacking we can get the information but we can't filter what's coming in and so having conversations like this where you can hear in long format people's perspective not just from what they've learnt but how the context of their lives they're now a lot of these people are looking back through the hourglass about 20 years 30 years 40 years of a body of work we've seen enormous changes in both how that work's perceived the environment in which it's conducted and the context is going to be put in for the next generation and and talking about it i think from both sides that's a really powerful place to be and there it is an in-depth look into the origins of meet the ocean and how i found myself in front of this microphone to speak to you today i hope you enjoyed getting to know the team and the talent behind our podcast and a special thanks to Dr. Jimmy White for the reverse interview. With over 50 interviews already recorded around the world, we have plenty of stories that need to be heard. But in order to produce them all and to get them out to the public, we need your help. Become an ocean defender by joining Meet the Ocean's Patreon community. For even $1 a month, you will get access to exclusive content and stand tall in the knowledge that you are helping educate the public. Keep in mind, all donations are tax-free. We are a nonprofit, after all. To find out how to sign up, visit patreon.com forward slash meet the ocean. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash meet the ocean. Or just visit our website and follow the contribute link. There are tiers and rewards for every contribution, so pick your favorite. And stay tuned because there are plenty more episodes to come. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to subscribe to never miss an episode. And we will see you next time.